Welcome everybody to another episode and another trip through time. Ikuzu means let's go, so we shouldn't keep you waiting. In this episode we will have a guide to follow the dinosaur's footsteps. Dr. Philip Curry, one of the biggest experts in the dino world. Dr. Curry named dinosaurs like uh, Sinosauropteryx and the famous feathered dragon dinosaur Giganotoraptor played a pivotal role in expanding our understanding of, di of dinosaur biology and the ancient world they inhabited and we will try our best to follow up. Are you ready to go genuine, uncensored and unscripted, Dr. Curry? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I heard your origin story as a paleontologist with everything starting with a cereal, a simple cereal box, but can you share with our listeners how young Philip became Dr. Curry? Um, when I was six years old, I opened up a box of cereal and there was a plastic dinosaur inside and, uh, it actually wasn't a dinosaur, it was Dimetrodon, but that's another story. And, uh, um, I got fascinated with it and, uh, it was a series of eight that you got from, uh, this particular cereal. And, uh, I had my parents buy that cereal for probably about six months. I can hardly eat the cereal anymore because I ate so much of it. My parents were hard on me. They, they wouldn't let me dig to the bottom of the box and get the plastic dinosaur. I had to eat my way through the box, <laughs> but, um, so six years old and it was a plastic dinosaur that got me going, but really it was 11 years old. That was uh, pivotal. Um, at that time I read a book by Roy Chapman Andrews called all about dinosaurs. All about dinosaurs was in fact about all about what it was like to be a paleontologist or a scientist. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that idea excited me so much that I decided there and then that I was going to, um, collect dinosaurs when I grew up. And, uh, around that time, uh, I had been going to the Royal Ontario museum, uh, I lived in the Toronto area. And, uh, uh, then I noticed that, uh, all of the dinosaurs were in fact, uh, from Alberta, Canada. And so by the time I was 12 years old, I decided I was going to be a dinosaur paleontologist in Alberta, Canada. And the bizarre thing is that's exactly what I ended up doing. <laughs> yeah. And I mentioned the vitro to these two, the two dinosaurs, Sino, uh, Sinosaur, Sinosauropteryx and Giganotoraptor and Sinosauropteryx. Terex provided crucial evidence for the existence of feathers in non-avian dinosaurs and Giganotoraptor, massive feather dinosaur that challenged previous assumptions about dinosaur size. And this was a major breakthrough, right, in understanding of prehistoric world. And when you made these discoveries, did you have a hunch that this could be a paradigm shift, actually? Could you guess they will reshape our conception of dinosaurs today? Oh, certainly a paradigm shift in, in my thinking. Um, I guess I was one of those people who grew up with the idea that, uh, dinosaurs came from anywhere, or sorry, birds came from anywhere, but dinosaurs. And that was the conventional thinking when I grew up. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really funny by being a scientist, just how much prejudice you end up picking up, uh, from old ideas. And, uh, the old ideas are very prevalent in your education, of course, and to try and shift to a new idea is sometimes very difficult. So with Sinoceropteryx, uh, I got to work on that specimen see it, uh, when it was, um, first announced the discovery of it in Beijing and, uh, more relevant to me though, was Cotyteryx, which is, uh, um, the, really the second feathered dinosaur, which, uh, was the one I was more involved with. And, uh, Cartyteryx, uh, was more advanced in its feather structure than Sinoceropteryx. And there was absolutely no question that, uh, it's, uh, specimen, uh, or a series of specimens rather that, uh, are intermediate between birds and dinosaurs. I mean, it was, uh, such that, uh, as we looked at the specimen, we realized that there were characters there that, um, dinosaurs had that birds were not supposed to have. And, uh, yet there they were. 
So in a way, uh, we had to make a hard decision as to whether this thing was a uh, dinosaur in a typical sense, a uh, non-avian dinosaur, or whether it was in fact a bird. And to many people, the feathers were so bird-like, there was absolutely no question that this, this was uh, related to um, modern birds at some stage. Uh, but whether you called it a dinosaur or a bird really didn't matter. And so uh, for me, uh, it was really pivotal in my thinking, much more than Sinoceropteryx, because there you had uh, an animal with osteological or bony characters that clearly showed it was a dinosaur. And yet you had feathers that were exactly the same as modern bird feathers, uh, flight feathers or tail feathers or whatever. And uh, so uh, it didn't matter what you called it, it was intermediate, period. <laughs> and uh, so that, that one was um, uh, pretty amazing. What I didn't expect was that um, uh, there would be so much controversy surrounding it. And of course, around that time, um, there were people who were uh, still very adamant that birds could not come from dinosaurs. And in fact, uh, book on the origin of birds had just been discovered or just just printed a little bit earlier that summer and uh so the person had a big stake in this and consequently uh didn't want to see uh evidence come out that these were in fact feathers on a bird so there were uh, some pretty incredible things said uh, such as for example that it was actually a dinosaur skeleton that a bird had been crushed on top of and so the feathers belong to a bird and then the skeleton belonged to a dinosaur. Well, that's kind of silly. And uh, then with Sinoceropteryx, the, the argument was that the feathers were in fact not feathers, but that was uh, collagen fibers inside the skin of the animal. Um, but uh, of course, the, uh, the great thing was from that time period is that the Chinese were discovering so many good specimens um, in northeastern China that uh, we very soon had not just Sinoceropteryx and Cauditeryx and uh, Protoarchaeopteryx. We had um, almost a dozen different species of dinosaurs or early birds, even more so, and uh, they all showed exactly the same thing you would expect to see in uh, um, a series of specimens leading from one group of animals into another, in fact, in evolving. So uh, the argument started to become a little bit thin that, uh, um, that uh, you know, it can be birds. <laughs> yeah, but uh, like you said, to, to all th those prejudices, how did you fight all those con controversies? Because it seems the reaction of the community, or, or at least part of the community, was harsh. And how 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 long did it take to for it to be like uh, uh, accepted as a uh, something that is valid? Well, Sinoceropteryx was uh, found, of course, in 1996, and uh, we published the paper on Cauditeryx in 1998. So things were really hot between those two periods. Um, but I would say another four or five years before a lot of people were convinced. Uh, I mean, the funny thing is, like, like I was saying with my own thoughts, is that uh, if you're raised thinking that uh, birds could not come from dinosaurs, then there's a prejudice against it. And so it wasn't just paleontologists, it was also um, ornithologists and people who were, you know, just marginally interested in these things. They'd, they'd been raised with these ideas, they didn't look into it. Um, we had, of course, uh, in the meantime, found a lot of evidence, uh, not just feathers, but um, a lot of evidence to show that uh, osteologically, dinosaurs gave rise to birds. There, there were so many characters that showed that they were related to each other directly that uh, it almost seemed unscientific to say anything else. But feathers were something that uh, are in your face. I mean, we think of birds as being feathered animals and flying animals, and so that was more crucial. Uh, in the sense that if we're going to convince the general public, if we're going to convince most scientists who don't work on dinosaurs directly, then feathers was far more important than the 150 other characters that we had in the skeleton. Um, so it uh, uh, took a long time, I'd say at least five years, before much of the general public were aware of the fact 
that there were feathered dinosaurs. In fact, even today, there are people who aren't aware that there are feathered dinosaurs. Yeah, I, I mean, basically the first mainstream adaptations of dinosaur with feathers is uh, prehistoric planet David Attenborough did. They incorporated a lot of dinosaurs with the feathers. Exactly. And of course, this is right around the time that uh, um, the second Jurassic Park movie came out, and uh, um, they still didn't put feathers on their dinosaurs. <laughs> and so that, um, that was, of course, one of the biggest influences on the public, uh, the movie Jurassic Park and, and that whole series. And so uh, there, are, there were still people who... Um, didn't know that these new ideas had come out. Uh, the, you know, Jurassic Park was good in the sense that uh, it definitely made the association between birds and dinosaurs, but they still didn't put feathers on the dinosaurs. Yeah, and uh, we, we spoke actually to uh, Scott Hartman, a paleontologist as well, uh, about this, and he said something interesting, because we have a perception now of feathers and uh, wings used for uh, you know, used by birds and used only for flight, we have a, a, a very hard time grasping that it could be used for something else. I think this is similar to it because we, we are looking from this perspective now, we, we cannot grasp that it's something else maybe in the past. Yeah, and uh, that's, that's very often, uh, I mean, as humans, what we tend to do is simplify things sometimes too much. We tend to think it can be only one thing uh, that a uh, special adaptation is there for, whereas in fact it can have many purposes. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, is that uh, Bob Bakker and uh, Greg Paul and other scientists in the 1970s already said, well, you know, you can't just evolve flight feathers and start flying. They, they have to come from something else first. And so in the 1970s, uh, dinosaur artists started putting feathers on their dinosaurs. And uh, it made perfect sense that um, uh, if you have feathers, then you can adapt them into something that you can use for flying. But if you don't have feathers, they don't just suddenly appear. Um, they have to appear there for some other purpose first. And what Sinoceropteryx showed is that uh, probably the downy-like feathers that it had were in fact there for insulation. And uh, this made sense because the idea had been tossed around and argued about for a long time, too, as to whether or not dinosaurs were warm-blooded. And uh, you would expect that if it was, uh, the, these were warm-blooded animals, at least the theropod dinosaurs, that the small ones would have to have some kind of insulation on their body. If dinosaurs are, in fact, related to birds, you would expect it to be feathers of some sort. And so the discovery of Sinoceropteryx in 1996 was uh, something that had been predicted more than 20 years earlier. And uh, um, now we know, of course, that uh, in all probability, there's a sequence of changes that took place as dinosaurs evolved into birds, uh, where the feathers were initially used for insulation. Subsequently, they were probably used for show. That is, uh, um, if they wanted to attract the female, then they could be very colorful and showy and so on, the way they are in modern birds today. And uh, we think that something like Cauteryx uh, is an animal that uh, had feathers all over its body, but it had the long feathers behind the arms and at the end of the tail, not for flying because the arms were still too short and the feathers were too short, but they were longer feathers and they may have been there as a way of um, uh, displaying to potential females or scaring off a potential rival, who knows? But that seems to be the second stage. And then the third stage is once you've got something like that on your body, then of course it does give you um, the capability of gliding or flying. And if that's the case, uh, then you start um, pushing evolutionary, make those feathers even longer so that you're better at gliding or flying. And uh, so that's what we think the sequence may have been. Uh, of course, it may have been slightly different. There might have been more than one purpose involved in this. Who knows? Um, you know, we've come up with a lot of other novel ideas uh, in the sequence. But unless you're actually back there, um, dinosaurs were probably trying out all of these different things anyway. So how do you sort out which were the ones that worked and which were the ones that didn't work? Yeah, that's interesting. And... 
you talked in this video about baby dinosaurs and fossi uh, fossils uh, of baby dinosaur and its rarity. And you said, among other things, that when you noticed it and started excavating it, it took you a whole day to dig it out and just a school, that is. And we know fieldwork isn't actually uh, Dr. Grant's fieldwork from Jurassic Park, but decades later, you are still doing the, uh, the fieldwork, right? And like currently in Denmark. And how do you keep enthusiasm for it? Does it feel differently from 10 or 20 years ago? Uh, well, you know, uh, uh, every discovery you make is exciting uh, because you're the first person who's ever seen the bone. You you recognize what its significance is in some cases. In other cases, you you don't recognize it. And that's significant, too, because you might have something new. So the, the excitement is always there. But, uh, you, you know, you make, uh, probably every four or five years, you make just a super big discovery and it keeps you going for the next four or five years. <laughs> you have these little discoveries that are virtually every day, uh, where you find something that's, uh, ultra significant or something that's, uh, super exciting. But, uh, the, uh, every four or five years, you'll get a discovery that'll just knock your socks off. And, uh, uh, so the last one for us was, in, uh, Alberta in, uh, uh, 2014, actually, you know, it's not that it's the last discovery we made, but it was certainly the last, uh, super new discovery. And that was an animal called Storonicholestes. And, uh, Storonicholestes is related to Velociraptor. Uh, it was known since 1974 on the basis of just isolated bones. But in 2014, uh, my head technician, Clive Coy, ran across a few bones that he recognized as being from a small meat-eating dinosaur. And uh, uh, we uh, worked on it, and sure enough, it turned out to be an almost complete skeleton, just missing the end of the tail and uh, a few bones here and there in the body, but otherwise it was complete. And uh, this is an animal that's uh, beautifully preserved. It's got so much information in it that we're still doing research on it. It's, it's just fantastic. Uh, yeah. We don't have to have new discoveries always either. In Mongolia, um, I guess around uh, 2018, we discovered a site that had been worked by the Polish-Mongolian expedition back in um, 1965. And uh, uh, we wondered about the animal because the uh, skull had been found with the lower jaws, but the rest of the skeleton wasn't there. Now, that's really weird because with sauropod dinosaurs, um, the skull and uh, lower jaws tend to fall off the specimen because, of course, that's a small part of the body. But uh, when you get the skull and lower jaws together, then you should be able to find the skeleton too. And there has always been controversy around this dinosaur, which was called Namictosaurus. And the only way we could resolve that controversy was to find a skeleton or a skull with a skeleton. And uh, sure enough, we finally found the skeleton uh, at that time. Uh, it was because we couldn't find the original quarry is what the problem was. Uh, but when we found the quarry, then there was a skeleton there, and the skeleton's still going into the hill. And I understand why they didn't excavate it because the uh, cliff is three or four meters high, and you have to move uh, many tons of rock, many tens of tons of rock to get to it. Well, we finally got enough money together that this year we're going back to take the rest of that specimen out. And uh, we believe that it will solve all the controversy around Nemectosaurus and another dinosaur called Epistocelocardia. Um, so that's another exciting find, and it's a very different kind of exciting find. But, um, uh, you know, every year we have something like that. Uh, either something old, uh, something that gives you new information on, on uh, some aspect of the anatomy of an animal that we didn't know. I uh, give you new information on skeletons that have been collected as partial skeletons before, or the discovery of these super specimens where you have almost the whole skeleton preserved. And um, so there's so many different levels that we, we end up working on. Um, and it's always exciting.
Yeah, I had to ask because when we had Mark Lowen, a lawyer from Utah here, you know, and when I asked him about field work, does he st still do it? He said no, and I was just curious. How can you not do it when you are basically with your bare hands excavating parts of history? And, uh, and speaking, uh, you spoke about Mongolia earlier, and is it true because in one uh, show that goes on our national television, uh, there's this guy who travels through the world, and he was in Mongolia actually. And he said there, there is literally just fields of uh, uh, boneyards of dinosaur fossils laying on the ground on the Mongolia. Is that, is that true? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I work on two of the, the greatest places in the world. I work in Alberta, Canada, and I work in Mongolia. And uh, it's interesting because the, the reason I work on both of those in particular is because they're from the same time period and they have related dinosaurs. And so we found some kinds of dinosaurs that are preserved as whole skeletons in Mongolia that we only find little bits and pieces of in Alberta and vice versa. And so if we want to understand what's going on at that time period, um, then working on both gives you a very different perspective. So in Alberta, we have literally um, millions of bones exposed at any one time. Wow. The, uh, we can walk and say Dinosaur Provincial Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, there are places you can't step without stepping on dinosaur bones. Mm. Wow. And uh, in the case of Mongolia, though, it's a little bit different because in Mongolia, um, the bone isn't quite as common, but the number of skeletons you find is much more common. So we've calculated that in Alberta, it takes on average about four man months to find a dinosaur skeleton. So if you've got, uh, say, one person walking around in Dinosaur Provincial Park, it'll take them four months to find a skeleton. If you have four people, then it'll only take a month rather than the other way around, right? Yeah. And, uh, but in Mongolia, we basically find a skeleton every day. It's uh, oh. less... less uh, disarticulated bone and bone beds and things like that, isolated bones, but it's a lot more, uh, a lot more skeletons that we find there. And uh, a skeleton a day is absolutely amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, uh, but I mean, in Mongolia, they are not as protected as, as protected as in Alberta, right? No, so well, a lot of them got lost. Yeah, a lot got lost. We had a very bad period there from uh, about 2000 to 2010, where uh, poaching just went right, right through the roof in Mongolia. And uh, we were finding dinosaurs on the markets worldwide. And we're still finding them, of course, because from that time period, so many dinosaurs were collected. And uh, it was unfortunate because the way they collected them was not always very professional. In some cases, what they would do is find a skull. The skull uh, would be smashed up so that they could just take the teeth because they knew it was illegal for them to do that. Um, but the teeth bring a lot of money too. So if they smashed up the dinosaur and took the teeth, then the teeth could be sold. Um, they would make money on it, and that was unfortunate. So it was really sad for us who worked in Mongolia um, to see all these damaged specimens. And uh, um, in some cases, like I said, they, they would destroy a specimen just to get the teeth. In other cases, they would destroy it to get the skull or the hands or the feet. Um, but uh, in other cases, they actually collected the whole specimen. And we're pretty convinced that hundreds of specimens, in fact, were collected in that time period. Um, in Alberta, it... Uh, Really, since the 1970s, all dinosaurs have been uh, protected. Um, basically, the laws in Alberta are quite strict. They uh, no dinosaurs belong to even the people, of, or sorry, the, even the museums that collect them. They actually belong to the government of Alberta, or they belong to the people of Alberta. And so uh, it's a very different uh, game. Um, but uh, as it turned out, there was kind of a happy ending in this in that um, it uh, turned out that the Mongolians actually had passed a law in 1925 to protect dinosaur resources. 
and but they've forgotten about it. <laughs> it's been a long time dinosaurs just weren't considered very important and they didn't have this problem with poaching so so uh basically they didn't worry too much about it and they just plain forgot the law existed even and so it turned out in the end that Mongolia actually has the oldest law protecting dinosaurs and other types of uh, significant fossil resources, and uh, that they just had to reenact it and start enforcing it. And so uh, things have certainly taken a big turnaround, and uh, it's it's much better working there in Mongolia now again. Uh, okay. And we're finding the resources. Uh, fortunately, in places like Mongolia and Alberta. The reason so many dinosaurs get exposed is because erosion rates are very high, and so new specimens get exposed. Oh, so Mongolia was like uh, born Warsaw all over again. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> there are no rules but one. Drink Jägermeister at minus 18 degrees Celsius. So you said you have same dinosaurs in Alberta and in Mongolia. So is that the evidence of certain migration pattern between them? Yeah, that's certainly what uh, made me start thinking about uh, migration patterns and so on in dinosaurs. Uh, it's the reason we've worked in um, Central Asia for so many years. I actually started in 1986 and um, in China in the Gobi Desert and then Subsequently, we moved to Mongolia to work there, and I've worked there ever since. And uh, it's uh, because of the fact that we can learn so much about our own dinosaurs. Uh, it's it's um, one of the things we know about any dinosaur site or any fossil site, for that matter, is is that uh, you have different uh, ways that fossils get preserved. And there's always these biases involved, whether you like it or not. So, for example, in Alberta, uh, the rivers were very big, and there were a lot of tyrannosaurs. Tyrannosaurs would eat anything that was small enough to fit in their mouths, essentially. So if, if they eat it all, then it's gone. And so we have uh, very few specimens of small dinosaurs from a place like Dinosaur Provincial Park. Uh, basically, uh, not only did they get eaten, but uh, the river system was very active itself. And of course, small animals, uh, because of their size, they rot a lot faster, and the bones and skeletons fall apart. So you don't find small things. You either get, uh, they rot and they get destroyed by the river, uh, or they, in fact, get eaten by tyrannosaurs. Um, this means that uh, we have this bizarre situation where we have uh, all of these big dinosaurs, Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, um, even uh, some of the formations that have Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, um, but they're all adult animals. They're not uh, babies. They're, they're half grown to adult size. So they're all multi multi-ton animals. The evidence of the babies and the small animals that live with the dinosaurs comes in the form of just isolated bones and teeth, and they get mixed up in, into the whole thing. But when you're looking at isolated bones and teeth, unless you know what the whole animal looks like, then uh, you really are guessing, right, in a lot of cases. So, for example, the, uh, the very first uh, raptor uh, was not Velociraptor. It was, in fact, from Alberta, uh, and it had been found in... Um, basically, uh, that early period when the American Museum of Natural History was working in Alberta, and uh, uh, it's an animal called Dromaeosaurus. It's not a complete animal, though. It's, it's a partial skull and a, and a few bones from the postcranial skeleton. So they didn't even realize that it had this uh, big raptorial claw on its foot at the time. And uh, yet we found uh, many isolated bones over the years and many isolated teeth of Dromaeosaurus and of other raptors in, in Alberta as well, but we didn't know what they looked like. Um, on the other hand, you go to Mongolia and uh, we have these beds, well, let's take, for example, the Judokta beds where uh, Velociraptor was originally found. That was from uh, 1923. And uh, so... 
uh, eight years after the first dromaeosaur was found in North America. And uh, uh, it's a complete skeleton. So now looking at the isolated bones from North America and comparing them with the skeleton of Velociraptor told us what the whole animal should look like. Now, it didn't give us a good idea of how different Velociraptor and the North American raptors were, but uh, uh, it nevertheless told us in general what that animal looked like. And uh, over the years, the same kind of thing has happened. Mongolia has a situation where small animals can be preserved. And um, I won't go into the technicalities of it right now, but it, it, it means that if we want to understand the small animals in North America, we have to be able to understand the animals from Central Asia as well, uh, where the different preservational regimes allow us to find whole skeletons where we can look at the isolated bones and then compare them with the isolated bones we find from North America. And uh, there are still lots of dinosaurs being found in both Asia and North America. And uh, what we're finding is because there was enough interaction through migration uh, between North America and Asia, that uh, in most cases, um, all the same families or all the same types of dinosaurs were in both North America and Asia. So sometimes we find them first in North America from isolated bones, and then eventually we find them in Asia, or vice versa. And so it's it's um, a pretty exciting exciting process, but it's because of the differences in what happens in the environments as far as the preservation goes. Mm. Mm. And, and in your research, you found evidence of pack behavior, nesting behavior, predatory display, and all kind of behavior. But have you encountered uh, any unexpected finding or evidence that challenged your previous your uh, your previous assumption about dinosaur behavior? Well, I would say almost anything behavioral does challenge you right away <laughs> because <laughs> of the fact that uh, um, you know you you think about it, and particularly somebody who's been around as long as I have, where where we didn't believe that you could learn anything about physiology or. Uh, behavior or color or anything in dinosaurs. We, we just assume that you have a skeleton, you've got a dead animal, you can learn about the dead animal, that's about all you can learn. But uh, um, basically, over the years, we got so good at uh, understanding and interpreting fossil sites and specimens that we are learning all these other things. We're learning about the physiology of dinosaurs, whether they're warm blood or cold blood. Uh, we're learning about uh, how they use their brains. We're learning about uh, their behavior. And uh, the behavioral studies, of course, uh, um, you know, in the 1920s, people uh, speculated on these things. Uh, von Huna, for example, would look at the Platyosaurus beds from, from uh, Europe and decided that, uh, well, maybe these indicate migration. He couldn't do much with it, but I mean, it was a pretty good indication. Then Jack Horner started with the uh, duckbill dinosaurs and Hypsilophodons from Montana. And of course, that's uh, our neighbor, uh, Montana uh, to Alberta. And so it was uh, around the same time we started finding these massive ceratopsian beds. And, uh, you know, we're talking now, um, fossil beds, bone beds, where we may have thousands of animals represented from single herds of horned dinosaurs. And Jack Horner was finding the same thing in Montana for duckbill dinosaurs. To me, one of the bigger surprises, though, was um, when we found the Albertosaurus bone bed in Alberta. And uh, the Albertosaurus bone bed, Albertosaurus, of course, is uh, a close relative of the, the Tyrannos, it is a Tyrannosaur, it's a close relative of Tyrannosaurus rex. And uh, we'd always assumed that uh, these animals were uh, solitary animals simply because we only find the specimens one at a time. They're quite rare. They're, uh, they only make up about 5 to 10% of the population. And so when you only find them one at a time, your assumption is that they all lived alone. And uh, then the Albertosaurus bone bed came up. And it was actually a bone bed found by Barnum Brown back in 1910 when he was working in Alberta. 
And uh, almost certainly he recognized the significance of the fact that he had found uh, eight skeletons, parts of eight skeletons of Albertosaurus in exactly the same place. Because he collected only parts of the skeletons, and the parts that he collected were mostly left feet. And uh, what he was doing, I think, was collecting enough material to give him an individual count. Uh, how many individuals had he found? And uh, the trouble was that back then, of course, there was no way of accurately pinpointing where you find these things. Yes, it was in the Badlands of Alberta, uh, but where in the Badlands of Alberta? It's like looking for a needle in a haystack to find these things unless you've got photographs. Uh, photographs were expensive to do at that time. They're all done on glass-mounted slides. And uh, um, so there weren't many photographs. And in the end, there were only two photographs that allowed us to re-find the site finally in 1997. And uh, when we re-found the site, the guess was right that uh, Barnum Brown had recognized what he was um, finding, that it was uh, evidence of a pack of Albertosaurus that died together and they died together because they, in fact, were living together. And Brown hadn't excavated the whole site. Uh, he only had three weeks, and his tools were very poor. He had uh, only two other people helping him. Um, so we felt that if we could refound, refine the site, uh, which we looked for, and as I said, 1997, then, um, then we would maybe find more bolts. And sure enough, uh, we were able to take the number of individuals from the eight that Brown had found up to more than 20. Now, 20 carnivorous dinosaurs in one single place with very little evidence of any herbivorous dinosaurs, no evidence of feeding behavior, and so on, um, just suddenly changes everything. Um, so we had evidence now that uh, the carnivorous dinosaurs, uh, at times at least, formed packs, and the packs were probably hunting the big herds of dinosaurs that were passing through Alberta at the time. The uh, herds of thousands of horned dinosaurs and thousands of uh, duckbill dinosaurs. And the only way carnivores can uh, feed on those things, well, I guess there's more than one way, they could follow the herds from behind and then wait for animals to die. Well, it's not a very efficient way of doing things, and it doesn't usually work. Um, it works sometimes, but obviously you're not going to be able to feed a pack of 20 or more tyrannosaurs if, in fact, you're just waiting for animals to die. Uh, more likely what was happening is, is the tyrannosaurs form packs when the big herds of ceratopsians and hadrosaurs were moving through the region and they would use those packs of meat-eating dinosaurs to break up those herds so that they can, in fact, chase something out and kill it and eat the same way lions do. And uh, this uh, uh, was a very surprising um, idea to me at the time. Of course, it uh, also proved to be controversial for a while. Uh, I think it's less controversial now because uh, we, in fact, have uh, not just the Albertosaurus bone bed, but we have a number of other sites where carnivorous dinosaurs appear to have been moving at packs and died en masse together from some kind of natural catastrophe and uh, left their remains showing us that they were also packing animals with some kind of social behavior. So there could be a chance that a pack of Tyrannosaurus rex existed. Yeah, it's quite possible. Um, you know, we do have uh, the, the Tyrannosaurus rex called Sue. And in the same quarry that Sue uh, was found in, in South Dakota, there were also parts of two other skeletons of Tyrannosaurus rex found in that. They were different sizes than Sue. And uh, that suggests maybe three of those animals died together at the same time. But um, other tyrannosaurs, where we have, I think, stronger evidence of packing behavior, include the Spletosaurus, Teratophonius, and Tarbosaurus from Mongolia. And uh, so at least a couple of the species were packing like that, at least for part of the year. Um, and uh, 
It doesn't mean that all Tyrannosaurs did. Maybe Tyrannosaurus rex uh, didn't function more solo. Uh, you know, unless you have some evidence to to prove it, then you can't say that they all did it. Um, but, uh, you know, lions and tigers are uh, very closely related to each other, but their behaviors are rather different too. Okay. And tell me this, if you had a time machine and you could witness the behavior of a single dinosaur species firsthand in its natural habitat, which species would you choose and what specific behavior or interaction would you hope to observe? And not get eaten. <laughs> yeah, one. Great. I think I'd want to go back and uh, make sure that I uh, was up in a tree somewhere so I was safe. Uh, Tyrannosaurs, I think, would be one of the fun ones to actually see. That's something like Albertosaurus or Tyrannosaurus rex. And the reason for that is is that, uh, you know, I mentioned before that baby dinosaurs tend to be quite rare. And uh, um, it's only been uh, really in the last 20 years we've realized that baby Tyrannosaurus look very different than the adult versions. The adult versions are massive animals. They're, they've got these very powerful jaws, uh, teeth that uh, were adapted basically for biting right through bone. Um, very powerful animals, but because of that uh, amount of musculature and everything that it takes uh, to uh, run an animal like that, these animals probably were very fast. And uh, they were faster than the animals they were eating. So that that's okay. So they can survive fast enough. <laughs> fast enough. But uh, it's not very efficient necessarily. And as it turns out, baby Tyrannosaurus look a lot more like Dromaeosaurus, raptors. Um, these are animals that are very lightly built. Uh, they don't have the powerful jaw muscles and so on of the adults. The, the skulls even look more like raptor skulls than, than the adult skulls because they're very long faces and very narrow skulls. And uh, the teeth are very narrow as well. They're, they're very different kind of adaptations. But more importantly is their hind legs are very uh, long and slender and they're proportioned more like the hind legs on ostrich and dinosaurs, or ornithomimus, for example. And so the small animals are very active. They're agile. They're fast. Uh, they uh, probably hunted differently than the adults. But when you find them together in a single herd, uh, such as we did with the Alberta Saurus bone bed, or a single pack, then you realize that uh, if the babies and the adults are hanging out together, they may have in fact served a different function in the behavior of the pack. And uh, so the baby um, Albertosaurus, for example, or the baby Tyrannosaurus were very fast animals. Uh, maybe they were used as a runners. They would move into the herds of uh, duckbill dinosaurs or horn dinosaurs and try and chase something out. If they could kill it, they would. But in all likelihood, they couldn't necessarily do that. They were too lightly built, not powerful enough. But they could chase it back towards the adults. And the adults with these massive jaw muscles and everything else would actually do the killing. And uh, it sounds pretty fantastic, but uh, I mean, the reality is that uh, lions essentially do the same thing. The big lions, the, the males especially, uh, aren't really the active hunters. It's, it's the teenage lions, and they're the lightly built ones, and they do most of the hunting, and then the adults benefit from that. So I could see that uh, it would be wonderful to be able to watch a herd of um, big uh, horn dinosaurs or big uh, duckbill dinosaurs and see what that's been ripped apart <laughs> exactly but i would like to be in the tree <laughs> but that that would support the theory right that uh, uh dinosaurs were some of the dinosaurs were uh active in parenting the the the, the, the offspring yeah and i i really believe it the albertosaurus bone bed as i said has more more than 20 individuals in it and uh, the smallest one is about a year and a half old. Uh, it's less than two meters long. It's very lightly built. And the biggest one is about nine meters long, and it's it's quite massive. Um, so uh, you can't 
at least I can't come up with an explanation as to why the babies and the adults would be together in the same pack that died at the same time, unless, in fact, uh, there was some kind of parental care going on. Yeah, that's what, right. That would also uh, make the case for the packs not forming just uh, for hunting, but for other purposes as well. Exactly. And, uh, you know, all these things uh, in, in modern ecology and modern ecosystems, uh, you realize that uh, there is more than one function uh, when animals get together like that. The behavior allows other things to happen, whether it's mating, whether it's movement from one region to another, whether it's hunting, uh, or all of these things together. Uh, there's benefits. Is there enduring mystery or a question that <laughs> about dinosaurs that keep you up at night? <laughs> uh, not that keeps me up at night because I decided a long time ago that extinction is going to be a hard one to, <laughs> to run down. <laughs> or the, uh, the problem is that um, there are so many ideas out there about the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And uh, those ideas, uh, in most cases, have never been tested. Uh, in most cases, they're just uh, ideas that are developed while somebody's sitting at their desk or dreaming at night. <laughs> and uh, uh, the problem is that the, the amount of evidence you would require to prove one in one way or another that uh, dinosaurs became extinct rapidly or slowly, for example, or the dinosaurs became extinct at the same time all around the world. Um, these are things that are not that easy to prove without a lot of evidence. And uh, even today, we don't have so many paleontologists in the world who work on dinosaurs. And as a consequence to this, the uh, accumulation of evidence from the time when dinosaurs died out is not very strong. And we need a lot more evidence. So Alberta is a great place to be because we have um, basically the last 15 million years of dinosaurs uh, represented along the Red Deer River. And it's like a river of time. We can go to, say, Dinosaur Provincial Park, and there we have more than 50 species of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were at their zenith as far as their... Uh, diversity was concerned. You go up the Red Deer River and you go up in time. So you go from uh, about 75 million years ago to about 70 million years. And at Drumheller, we have a different formation and a different type of um, related dinosaurs, but they're not the same dinosaurs because the time period was enough that the dinosaurs evolved and changed. And uh, there, though, we don't have as great a diversity. Instead of 50 species of dinosaurs, we have about 25 to 30 species of dinosaurs. Then you continue upstream, and you end up in a place called Huxley. And at Huxley, we have the terminal beds of the Cretaceous, 65 million years ago. And in those beds, we have um, fewer than a dozen species of dinosaurs. So what the Alberta record is saying very clearly is that over that last 15 million years of their history, their diversity dropped from 50 to 15 in the area. Now, even if you start looking at all of the latest Cretaceous sites in Western North America, and uh, then you're still going to find that there's more diversity that's not evident. They're just specimens we haven't found, of course, in Alberta. But we're still not talking about more than, uh, say, 30 species of dinosaurs known for the terminal Cretaceous beds. And yet, in just one site in Alberta from 75 million years ago, we have more than 50 species of dinosaurs. So I would say that Western North America argues very strongly that dinosaur diversity, biodiversity, was dropping quite dramatically uh, in that last 15 million years of their history. Now, uh, does that answer the question? No, because um, as I said before, uh, part of the problem is that we don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. Yeah, we've got terminal Cretaceous beds in Argentina, we've got terminal Cretaceous beds in other 
parts of Europe and so on. But uh, we don't have as good a fossil record. So we don't know if the same thing is happening everywhere else in the world. And uh, there are very few places in the world that actually have the end of the Cretaceous represented. So uh, can we really say that on the basis of what we have in North America, that all dinosaurs became extinct worldwide at the same time? No, we can't. We just don't have the evidence for that. We're assuming that. Um, but uh, um, basically, earlier in my career, I decided this is not a question we can answer on the basis of any evidence we're going to get in my lifetime. Uh, we can show what's happening locally uh, in Western North America and maybe at a couple of other sites in the world, but we can't prove that dinosaurs died out universally um, at the same time, and we can't prove that in all areas of the world the biodiversity was dropping the same way it was in Western North America. So uh, if, if anything keeps me awake at night, it would be that one. <laughs> so... Uh, do you have alternative for mass extinction? Well, I, I, I really do think the, uh, the idea that the um, dinosaurs were dropping in biodiversity is, is very real. I think the uh, uh, interesting thing is that not only is it dropping in biodiversity, but the animals are shifting in a way. So when you look at uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, compared to Albertosaurus or Gorgosaurus. If you look at Ankylosaurus compared to Eoplocephalus or Scolosaurus. If you look at Anatotitan uh, or Anatosaurus uh, copi compared to the earlier duck-billed dinosaurs. These are all the largest known dinosaurs of their families. And so something's going on that's favoring not only diversity dropping, but the dinosaurs either becoming bigger or becoming more primitive representatives of their families, which is really peculiar. So there is something ecologically happening that I think fits very nicely with the idea that uh, biodiversity was dropping probably because of climatic change at the time. And uh, that uh, when the asteroid hit 65 million years ago, roughly, um, it caught the dinosaurs on a bad day. Their diversity was down. And uh, not having um, as much diversity meant they weren't as adaptable and that uh, the asteroid was able to do a much more devastating uh, thing on dinosaurs than it would have done if it had happened, say, 10 million years earlier. Is it like, is it like they were going through another evolutionary cycle and there was this disruptor that caught them off guard, like you said? Yeah, uh, that's probably a good way of looking at it, yes. I think uh, by being bigger, it means the bigger you are, of course, uh, the better adapted you are as long as everything is stable. But if things become unstable suddenly, then you can't change fast enough um, to, uh, to survive any kind of major catastrophe. So it's the big animals that always take it in the neck. And, uh, of course, a lot of the dinosaurs were massively big at the time. Uh, so they had no chance. Uh, the asteroid probably called, caused a short-term climatic change that uh, basically um, wiped them out for a generation. Once you get wiped out for a whole generation, you're gone. <laughs> yeah. It's like the nuclear bomb with us soon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. The rocks will survive. <laughs> yeah. We, we can go, we could go on for a day, but unfortunately we have to wrap up. But before, before we do that, we have a little tradition where we say a quote on Montenegrin language and translate it to English. And I picked a quote from our poet, uh, Yugoslavian poet, uh, Mika Antic, and he said on uh, our language, Kad neko mjeri dubinu okeana, se zabada šta tamo gdje mu je dostup. And on English it would be, when one measures the depth of the ocean, does one stick a stick where it is accessible? So it's a uh, fine anecdote about uh, the, trying to find the answers for the unknown. Yeah, it's so much fun by having these mysteries too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to talk with us today, uh, uh, Philip, uh, if I could call you Philip. <laughs> Absolutely. And it was really enjoyable talk. Thank you. You're very welcome.
Nice talking, dear. Bye bye. We stay genuine, uncensored, and unscripted, and we always will, as we have to order our usual. Share us, subscribe us, and stay tuned until the next Wednesday. Iguzo!